My name is Bruce Pond, one of the founders of BigchainDB as well as Ocean Protocol. It's uh, a pleasure to see all of you here. Uh, it's a great turnout and we're very happy that you've taken some time out of your evening to join us. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the token distribution. But before I start that, just to be safe, <laughs> this is for informational purposes. It's not meant to be investment advice. It's not meant to be a solicitation. We're not registered as a securities broker dealer or an investment advisor with any US Securities and Exchange Commission, Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or any state securities regulatory authority. All information is reasonably accurate and reliable. Errors may occur. All materials are provided as is without warranty. We're not responsible for typographic errors or inaccuracies in the content. This communication should not be used as sole basis for making any acquisition decision. Readers should use the information as a starting point for additional research and token mention in order to allow the reader to form their own opinion. We don't guarantee, warrant, or represent any acquirer purchasing or selling such tokens will profit from doing so. The possibility exists that all acquired, that acquirers may lose all or substantial portion of your contribution were you to buy or sell such tokens. Non-factual statements, including statements regarding future possible events, constitute subject only subjective views and or present intentions are not representations or warranties or subject to change. Some information may, may be obtained from third party sources that Ocean Protocol believes are reliable, but we have not independently verified. That's good enough. <laughs> we started on this journey a while ago. Um, we were one of the very first blockchain companies in the world um, that was not financial related. And so we, we do have a mission and it's gelled over time. And what it is, is essentially giving people power in a new data economy. Something that's arising, we're all seeing around us that your data, machine data, company data, all that sort of stuff is extremely valuable. But it remains locked up. And we're creating a protocol that unlocks that data and allow people, actually, the people who create that data to truly own and control it while making it available for research and development and new products and services. And this aligns with our original mission, which was a scribe.io, a service to protect intellectual property, which if you think about it, data, anything digital now is intellectual property. And so Ocean takes us back in a sense to where we started from. And if we do it right, data will have a value, which means that every single one of us who produce data, we can generate revenue. We'll break down data silos because Google, Amazon, Facebook, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, they won't have a lock on the data because they have the AI and the data, where most companies only have the data, or most AI startups only have the algorithms. We can bring that together. And a new data economy arrives, something that actually is <laughs> way lower than what it could or should be, but because it requires such high trust for the privacy, for the security, and for the control <laughs> that people are asking for so that they can actually have visibility on what's happening to their data. And so that's why we're doing this. Um, we strongly believe that that is one of our core missions to make it so that when AI comes, when automation robotics comes, that every single individual on earth still has the ability to have their ideas recognized and rewarded for that, to have their data under their control. And Germany is the best place that we can think of to do this because it sits in the European Union, which has placed um, such an important um, kind of uh, model for how people should control their data. And this is not going to be a fast process. We, like, data is meant to be locked up. Every single person who's ever worked in IT knows that data sits in silos and you have procurement, you have uh, IT audit, you have regulatory stuff, you have all these different groups that are saying, no, you can't share that data. And the question is, if it's your data, if it's not in somebody else's servers, but it's actually your data, can you actually start owning this? So we do believe that this is a mission that will take a um, decade or more. So to fund this, we're gonna use a token. We had been working on a scribe, we'd been working on BigchainDB, which was fundamentally data-driven use cases. It was about how do we make it so that data has clear provenance and attribution and that we can give control back to the people. 
But what happened in 2017 was, as you all know, this madness of tokenization. And all the blockchain projects, some that couldn't get funding, some that had funding, they all tokenized. We're one of the last companies that hasn't tokenized from the original blockchain cohort from 2014 to 2015, 16, right? So this is something that makes logical sense in a way because tokenization allows for us to build a data economy around a token. And there's about 20 other projects out there and such like that. But we hope that we're one of the, the deepest talented teams in terms of blockchain, data, and AI in the world. So we have a couple of principles that align to our original mission. And that is that the token distribution will be about fairness. Everybody has a fair shot to get ocean tokens. If people are able to get in on early access, there are going to be lockups investing and that the price differentials within the token distribution won't be absurd. So some of the token distributions gave such a great deal to the early people that it was in some ways a Ponzi scheme, right? Because even in the early access all the way to the public sale, the differential was 20, 30, 40 times difference. We're trying not to do that. Community. We focus on the AI and data community, crypto community as well. Um, because they are the ones struggling with getting access to data. I, I, I was on calls the last couple of days. Every single company I talked to it said, we need more data. And so if you can unlock this data for us, then our, our startup can survive. On the other side, I had talks with companies who said, we have so much data and we don't know what to do with it, but we don't know how to share it. Help us. Um, as part of the community, we also have to make sure that enterprises, governments, NGOs, anybody outside of the crypto space needs to feel comfortable. And so we need to comply with the laws as best as we can in every single jurisdiction. And we need to seek enterprise and government buy-in. You know, the crypto space was kind of anti-government, anti-financial system. We share in some of these, um, some of the, the anger and the frustration people have in not having control and, and angry at the banks, for instance, for causing the financial crisis. But we still need to work with the established system because that's the only way to get things over. Right? while still having this Berliner attitude of let's, let's, let's be a little bit anarchistic. <laughs> Accountability. We want to raise a reasonable amount of money for reaching milestones and, and being very public about it and then setting a standard for ourselves and then um, being able to communicate to you guys and be accountable to you. We will use the funds to build the protocol and kickstart the ecosystem. So all the money raised goes to the ecosystem essentially and then just to fund the development. And then finally, any of the, the foundation or founder tokens, we vest over five years. Yeah, so we're in it for the long term. Ocean token, 1.41 billion tokens. Limited cap forever, 1.41 billion. It's a total volume of water on Earth in cubic kilometers. <laughs> Our ticker symbol, what we'd hope for is OCN, Ocean, 25% for acquirers um, with a public token exchange split in two phases. The first phase is um, in the first week of March, which funds the network development. And then at network launch, sometime in Q1 2019, we're gonna have another raise, and that is to seed the ecosystem. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. We will release the token on network launch, so everybody's essentially locked up for a year. Um, if, you, if you get into the public token exchange, you're also locked up for another six months after that, like in linear investing. And the token is a utility token. There's no dividend, there's no ownership, no voting, profits from token. Ocean is inseparable from the network and protocol. That's kind of the definition. So what's the timeline? Well, we actually started the project officially somewhere around July this uh, last year. Um, we got the, the website and the basic stuff up and running around September. And we did some seed fundraising uh, just to get the ball rolling, pay for the legal fees, tax and accounting, all that kind of stuff in November last year. And now we're going to do a pre-launch fundraising, which has two components. It's got an early access for kind of institutionals, and then it's got a public access. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. And then finally, we'll have a public launch on network launch kind of thing. Um, to seed the fundraising, especially once we've gotten the network ready. So it's kind of like series C, series A, series B kind of thing, right? 
This is the difference between the phases, and I want this to be very clear to everybody because it's important that we, we kind of like Sarah. So the target group in the seed phase is champions, people who helped us get here, people who, who were with us all along for your journey um, and supported us. You know, that was in um, October, November where we did that. The price per ocean was eight cents. They have a vesting of 12 months from the time of network launch, which means they're locked up for essentially two years or a uh, weighted average is uh, 18 months. We raised four million during that seed, we had a cap of about 500,000 per investor on an institutional level. Individuals was, was much lower naturally. And then we had about 70 contributors. We're aiming for 50. In the pre-launch, we're going for the early ecosystem and community. People understand crypto naturally, data communities, AI communities, um, a few companies who are comfortable with this type of stuff. Um, March, we're going, it's 20 cents a token. Um, anybody who buys in the pre-launch is locked up for six months after network launch or weighted average 15 months. We're raising 18 million euros, 22 million US dollars. And then we have a contribution cap because we don't want, we don't want any single entity to own too much. I mean, um, and so we want to make sure that it's spread around. Whereas, um, so institutionals get up to 1 million. Individuals is probably three to 10,000. Um, and we're aiming for 500 people, but there's a chance that we'll get more. And then finally, in the network launch, it's just a general community, data, AI crowd, and everybody else. Um, prices to be determined, there's no vesting, um, the raise is to be determined, and then it'll probably be around three to 10,000 also, and we'd like 20,000 investors. We'd like 20,000 acquirers of the token because we think that spreading these tokens around, you don't, like data is everywhere around Earth. On every single continent, there's data, so we want these tokens where they can provide liquidity. So the milestones, so kind of what I was going back to is we had seed, pre-launch, public, and then a secondary fundraising. So that's kind of like further on um, once the network is launched. What that is, is, you know, we had the milestone to do the seed of like get out a white paper primer, get the marketplace framework, set up all that stuff, build up the team up to about 10 people. And then on the pre-launch fundraising, 6.4% um, of the tokens split equally, 9 million on each side, 3.2% for the early access, 32 for the public. And here, we're going to announce uh, relatively shortly in an official kind of like blog and everything as well as the Singapore government will do this, but we've signed up Singapore um, as an early customer. They are providing essentially a regulatory sandbox that allows any company to share their data without risk of lawsuit if there's data leakage or personal information that gets, gets out. We have about 30 customers signed up and we also have a list of advisors that we'll be announcing shortly. And then before we can do a public launch, we have to have gotten so far that we know that the network can be deployed. And we've also activated a data and AI community enough that you know, it, the community feels comfortable with. And we're gonna put 5.1% of the tokens in. And then finally, we'll do a secondary fundraising of 10% where we can accelerate the ecosystem. Um, and where we also have a more decentralized governance so that the, the foundation steps back a little bit. They focus on kind of like seeding the ecosystem with technologies that can help ocean protocol, but not being kind of the driving force, which is what we are now, right? Um, yeah. So that, that's interesting um, because what we want to do is activate pretty much anybody who, who has a service that can be data, compute, storage, um, and that type of thing. So the pre-launch token distribution, early assets, um, it, there's a few reasons why we have that. So I just wanted to explain that. It, it's the de-risk, the token distribution, just in case the public says, no, this is a crap project. Um, strike strategic partnerships to access the AI and data community. So, you know, there are a lot of VCs who do have access to a portfolio of 30 or 40 uh, AI companies. That's important for us to, to actually have that concentrated uh, group of AI companies. Um, it is an, a chance for them actually though to get a larger stake because most of these companies, if, if you give them like a smaller stake, it's not interesting for them. The overhead for them to manage this invest, this um, acquisition of tokens for them is just not worth it. So we do have to give that portion to them to make it interesting for them. Um, but it is the last instance because as soon as that closes, we have the public pre-launch and what happens is um, we have the, uh, a whitelist open probably around February 15th the pre-launch starts March 7, and then every individual contributor will get a cap. So let's say we whitelist 1,000 people, the cap could be 5,000 euros, and then we design it so that we'll probably sell out, and, but not, any, not everybody whitelisted 
will be able to get in if everybody takes their maximum. So what we expect is, let's say 5,000, and some people will just say, you know, I'm a student, I'll put in 500. Well, that 4,500 can go to somebody else, that type of thing. So, so we're designing it so that it's as fair as possible, but it's still um, a need for you to get in as quick as possible, right? So, so you don't dilly-dally. How do you participate? Well, globally, it's not considered security, right? It's a utility token. Um, we're under, if you're, if you're watching from America, we're under a Reg S exemption, but we will still do a full KYC and AML. Um, we have people from, uh, formerly of, of banks who did uh, KYC and AML, so it's, it's at the level um, that banks would do on customers. It's required. I'll explain why in a second. If you are a resident of the US or Canada, we're under a Reg D exemption, which means that we only accept accredited investors and they have to prove a certain income or <laughs> net worth already. And this is just necessary. The reason why is because most projects that didn't do that, they're getting pulled from exchanges. They're getting pulled from exchanges because the exchanges cannot verify and they cannot verify the identities of the people who have acquired the token and that is something that the world has decided, the banking system, the regulatory system, the government have decided that we want to fight money laundering, ter terrorist financing and all that sort of stuff. So the reason why we do KYC and AML is because when the, the network goes live, we know the owners of the, we, we have the identities of the tokens in Europe under GDPR law with the Chinese wall between us and the KYC team. So we never see any of that information that's in a separate kind of unit. And if a, if a regulatory authority asks who are the people from our jurisdiction, so let's say America, we can give them that list of names and we have to be able to do that. Yeah? The type of things, if you will uh, want, do want to whitelist, you'll need your proof of identity, address, uh, ID in America, social security number, and uh, proof of accreditation. If you're a company, you need uh, full beneficiary ownership and company numbers, etc. To prepare, you follow us on Twitter, Telegram, and Slack. We already have, I guess, a couple thousand on Twitter and about 1,200 on, on Telegram and five or 600 on Slack. I would recommend you download this tool for your browser called Kryptonite. It's a um, product of MetaCert, and MetaCert builds tools that shows when you're getting fished. So if you go, um, if the day comes when, or even before our launch, there's probably going to be a ton of fraud sites, right? And you click on something, what happens is in the, in the corner there's a shield and it turns from black to green. And green means that you're on the Ocean Protocol site. We work with MetaCert on this, so they whitelist every single one of our URLs, and you know that it's safe. And for those of you who don't download Kryptonite, and you um, and you go to a phishing site, I mean, please do that. So if it's a bad site, if it's a phishing site, the, the, the shield stays black. So anybody watching on video and such like that and here in the audience, please download Kryptonite. Um, it's a great product. And then go whitelist at oceanprotocol.com starting February 15th, that's when it opens. Um, we will sh shut that down around February 28th, March 1, and then we will tell everybody what the cap is. Um, and then what the conversion rate to Ethereum is, and then good luck. <laughs> data, and I just wanted to reiterate, data is held and stored under the strictest privacy laws in the world, Europe, um, and it's conformed to EU GDPR. We take, um, we're about data, and we're about giving you ownership of your data. We're also about making sure that it's protected. Yeah, so we're doing our best to, to make sure that happens. So where did the money go from the token distribution? It goes to several groups. It goes to us here in Berlin, BigchainDB, to build the network, to, to, to build that cool, cool stuff that Don was talking about. Uh, it goes to DEX to build this marketplace, this user experience, plus uh, do business development in multiple cities around the world. We have many technology partners that we want to activate. So there's a lot of startups out there that deal with AI or data or, or some other aspect that um, they could use grants or funds and they don't necessarily want to do VC funding. We want to seed the network um, and build a global ecosystem. We have to pay for the standard stuff, the legal tax regulatory and stuff. And then we also want to put money into developers, bounties, priors, and outreach. So meetups around the world and getting um, the developer community involved because when we create a new data economy, these are all completely new jobs that don't have job titles right now. And that's kind of cool. And it's up to developers to find these ideas because this data is going to be there, we're going to expose it, and now what can we build with this? 
This is the fun part. And so we really want to get the ecosystem going. Um, once again, I reiterate, the money goes to the community. And it goes, you know, in, in terms of us to build a protocol for the community, but it, this is about building an ecosystem. How Big Chain DB wins, how Big Chain, how Dex kind of gets our cut, the token. If we do a good job on the ecosystem, the token rises, and that's where we win, right? So we're not the the, the proceeds go to the community. How does it work? Um, it's kind of like this. Up until about 50 million, it's 45, 45 Big Chain DB. We think that. Uh, it should, over the long term, over four to five years, we should require no more than 25 million each to do what we need to do to build technology at that point. Um, you know, some of the projects, they essentially had uh, very poor foundations, like in terms of cash positions, and so the development has slowed down. And as I said, this is a long-term thing. We need a core team that is dedicated, committed, um, and is funded, and so that's what the funding is gonna go to. But up until a certain point, no more than four or five years, that's enough. The, the ecosystem, if we've done a good job, should be self-sustaining. And then anything over, so you know, if we raise you know, 30 million in total, then you know, it gets split uh, in, in, in that proportion. Um, and then we just have to work it and deliver it. And then at about 50, 60 million, then everything else goes to ocean. So if we raise more than that, then it's all towards the community. It's all about activating. Uh, developers uh, getting into the AI community and working with enterprise. The foundation will have 10% of the tokens and that they're custodian to distribute this to the community. So developers and startups, the bounties and prizes, outreach researchers to give data credits, ocean data credits, startups, and then also just to fund the, the, the standard uh, administrative aspects. Um, they'll receive 10% uh, of the tokens, 141 million, over five years and six equal installments to fund and incentivize the community. Big Chain DB Dex, we each receive 10% of the tokens, we get it over five years and six equal installments. So, that is the token distribution. I'd be happy to take some questions. Um, and before I do that, you want to stick around because there's a really cool thing that's never been presented publicly which is what Ricardo is going to be doing shortly, and that is, what is the value of a data economy? And at the end of what he presents, he's going to pose a challenge to you, and we're going to have a prize. Um, and if you can figure out what the value of a data economy is, you can figure out what's the currency that allows that data economy to be thriving and have proper liquidity. And if some of you have been following this space, you know that Chris Berniska is one of the leading lights um, in terms of doing a crypto asset valuation model, in terms of like what are the dynamics that determine what the, what the price of a token should be or could be. Um, and that's what Ricardo's going to be talking about soon. So um, I'll take some questions. The microphone is working. <laughs> when is the business white paper available? Oh, yeah. yeah, I can tell that. So um, <laughs> another, oh, so that's a reminder for me. <laughs> Well, I was thinking actually we'll do that after Ricardo. Yeah, let me, let me just do that after Ricardo. Thank you. Any, any questions, please? Yes, sir. So my question is, uh, who's going to be maintaining the Ocean Protocol after those five years, you're saying, for funding? And uh, what's going to be the source of this funding for whoever develops it after five years? So as I said, there's 10% um, of the tokens that are held back, and the foundation has the has the choice to either like emit that in a third ICO or just to emit that Ripple style um, over time to fund it. Um, this space is moving very fast, so three months is like a year, right? And so one of the things that we don't have solved for, and that's why we do need human governance, is um, how do you manage this whole thing, right? But I do believe that in five years, we're gonna make a lot of progress. And one of the goals within five years is to have a more decentralized form of governance, to have the community deciding on where the funds go, how this ecosystem should be managed, and how do we make it so that it doesn't get centralized or captured in some way. I don't have any answer to that, I don't know what it is, but we have moved, we've moved from the point four years ago where BigChainDB couldn't get a bank account, to one year ago where we've had this nascent Ethereum network of 10 or 20,000 developers, to this year where, um, 
grandmothers were asking, you know, what is this Bitcoin? And so I think we can do a lot more in five years, and I'm just hoping that governance is one of those things that we work on. But you're planning more human way rather than DAO, right? Right now we're human. In the future. In the future, <laughs> the ideal way is one person, one vote, right? And so it can be decentralized, but still democratic for people and not machines, right? So I'm not looking at DAOs in that sense, like you know, like it, it, like you let an AI run. The, the governance, although that could be more efficient, but I don't know. Um, but, you know, one person, one vote kind of thing. And that, we're, go towards that and then find a way to put that into a decentralized um, infrastructure. <coughs> no questions. <laughs> uh, what, what exactly would be, or if you kind of already explained, the utility of the token? Like, you said it's like part of the protocol, or yeah. can you use it to buy data in yeah. the marketplace, or can yeah. you define it, or, or is it already predefined? Like yeah, so there's, there's essentially three ways that Ocean becomes a utility and it's inseparable. Number one is the obvious thing. I acquire Ocean token so that I can use it to buy data, and data will be priced um, essentially in Ocean token, either as a fixed price or in real time, so fiat to crypto conversion. Number one, that already fulfills the argument for utility token. The second thing is, in most of these decentralized systems, you have this thing called a civil attack. So in our case, what is the civil attack? It's putting shit data, or it's putting copy data, um, or it's putting, like, uh, like, just trying to spam the network. So we can use Ocean Token as a staking mechanism. So that if you publish data, you need to stake against it with Ocean Token. And what happens is if I say I want this data and it turns out to be bad data, the person who posted that data or the entity that posted that data loses their stake. It's friction. On the other hand, let's say it's NASA data. It's, it's climate data that the world has decided to preserve because um, it was something important. And NASA staked a little bit. But NASA has got a pretty good reputation. Everybody kind of likes NASA. And what happens if the community gets behind that data and says, I'll stake also with NASA. And I'll put more and more and more. So if that data is ever wrong, everybody loses their stake. But if that data is right, whenever that data is traded, that's the third reason why we have a notion, the block reward. The block reward, the 45% of the tokens that are held back, are for validating transactions, but also a portion of it goes towards the people who provide data. Now, why is this? So if, I have, if I'm a company and I have data and it's valuable, I'm selling it for a price. So that's pretty good, right? Why do I get more block reward from that? Well, if you think about it, just like Amazon exposed this long tail of 250,000 books where most bookstores could hold only 10,000 or 30,000, we have a lot of data that's valuable but cheap. And at a certain point, it's not worth to curate that data. It's not worth to keep it updated. So data gets stale, it gets old. And a little bit of block reward, whenever that data gets used, just like when this one book gets bought once every three years, having it available is still valuable for us. And so the block reward incentivizes free data. It's a little bit of like this elegant design where the block reward for a large company, if I'm selling financial data, I'm getting $100,000 a pop for that stuff. I could care less about the block reward. But if I'm a student and I just need to do a research paper and I need to clean up some data and then I repost it because it was free anyways and, some, and somebody starts using it, I get a little bit of block reward. That's kind of cool. Can you imagine people all around the world cleaning up data so that our data becomes cleaner better provenance, labeled. That's essentially what the block reward does. So there's three reasons. Number one is just to buy and sell data. Number two is to stake and to win. And number three is the, the block reward itself. Cool. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ricardo Garcia. He has done a lot of great work for us in terms of the valuation model. And uh, he'll present the same thing to you. Mm -hmm.